Hey, good evening, and uh, welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Captain Mary Dan Pionk. Uh, I'm the uh, executive director of the Navy Supply Corps Foundation. And this is our second transition focus webinar. Uh, we're planning to do uh, many more throughout the remainder of the year. So uh, thank you for taking time to join us. Um, the foundation is proud to serve all who have worn the oak leaf, whether prior service, retired, reserve, or active duty. And we need your support. Uh, please take a moment now or during the webinar or after the webinar and click on the QR codes to make a donation. Also considering registering with the foundation as a member. Um, if you're not yet registered, for, um, it's, it's free, costs nothing, and you'll be sure to receive our quarterly Oak Leaf newsletter. Our next one's coming out in the end of uh, July, and uh, as well as our monthly uh, e-newsletters to keep you connected to the Supply Corps uh, community. I know most of you know about, the, are familiar with some aspects of the foundation. Um, and what we do in some of our services, but we exist for you. Um, we're the only nonprofit organization offering program services to support the Supply Corps community. Um, and uh, our mission is really is to promote the heritage and traditions and uh, provide those services and programs to our, our, our community. Um, the foundation is governed by a board of directors that consists of active duty, reserve, retired, and prior service Supply Corps officers. And we're currently looking for new board members uh, to join the foundation board uh, starting in 2024. Um, you can go to our website, there's more information uh, if you're interested in how to apply. Um, you, you heard me talk about the Navy's Flock Corps community. Um, most people think that the foundation is just for officers. And really, in fact, we support um, um, all uh, the whole, the entire Flock Corps community, including families, uh, spouses, children, grandchildren of both Supply Corps officers and enlisted. And so what can we do for you? Well, uh, we are uh, your connection to the rest of the Supply Corps community. Um, next, we provide professional social network opportunities. Um, you go to LinkedIn, you go to our, some of the other social media. There's a lot of information out there you can connect with, not only with the foundation, but members of the foundation. Uh, again, all supply officers, active, retired, retired uh, reserve or prior. Um, and we also provide uh, you know, excellent opportunities as leaders, uh, both at the chapter level and at the foundation level. Um, and we have 38 chapters worldwide. So uh, there's many opportunities to become a chapter officer and, um, and, and work with the, with the chapters. Let's provide um, uh, transition services. And this is one area that we're really seeing as an area for us to grow in. Uh, we can assist you with your post-military career search and help you that smooth transition. Um, we, right now we're offering webinars, but we see ourselves in the future offering one day transition seminars and uh, one to three day seminars in the future. Um, and also uh, other services that we're working on with our uh, planning committee. It's now my pleasure to introduce um, and turn the webinar over to the moderator, which is Commander Retired Bob Dolan. Uh, Bob is our transition committee chair and he's also um, uh, a foundation board member. So Bob, over to you um, for uh, your introduction of the guest speaker. Okay, all right, thanks uh, Dan. Hopefully everybody's uh, doing well out there. Uh, some of the uh, recommendations and uh, suggestions that came out of the uh, 2023 uh, strategic uh, plan survey was to develop opportunities to provide services to uh, transitioning uh, supply personnel. This is the reason why the foundation is continuing to offer uh, webinars to bring these types of information and resources direct to foundation members. Uh, this evening's webinar will be focused on the financial considerations and challenges as you are uh, transitioning to the uh, civilian uh, sector. Uh, today's speaker is Mr. Tom Elliott, uh, founder of the uh, Prosperity uh, Solutions Group. Tom uh, attended uh, Purdue University on a uh, Navy ROTC scholarship, received his bachelor's degree and was commissioned in May of 1990. He served in the US Navy as a Supply Corps officer from 1990 to 2003. At the transitioning from the Navy, Tom built and started 10 companies in the fields of website services, computer and network support, aviation, real estate, financial coaching, direct sales, travel, and business consulting. Wow, that, that is a lot. He authored the book, Website 411, Business Survival in an Internet Economy, and is the author of Life After Debt uh, se Seminars, Webinars, and Workshops. He has also created the Financial Acumen uh, course. As questions uh, pop up during the uh, Tom's uh, presentation, 
please use the uh, chat function in Zoom and we'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, Tom, the stage is all yours. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with everybody. I've really enjoyed uh, staying in touch with my Supply Corps roots. Um, what I'm here to do tonight, uh, I've got to tell you, I, I'm going to disclaimer this a little bit by saying I'm not giving advice tonight. I'm not giving financial tax or investment advice, but I do want to share some insight uh, and some information that comes from working over the years with people transitioning from the military. It's one of the focuses that I've had. Um, and, you know, and working with the community as well to help people start businesses and whatnot. So what we're going to talk about today are a few things, and this is uh, kind of just a topic slide that we're going through right now. Um, we're going to talk about pay, military pay to civilian pay. We're going to talk about some benefits, and, and you may know some of these things from going through a TAP class or whatnot. But TAP class doesn't really focus a lot on the financial aspects of things. Uh, so I want to dig into a little more detail with that and, and kind of there's a lot of material to cover. So we're going to motor through some of this stuff. But I want to make sure that you have time for getting questions answered at the end. Uh, we're going to talk about tax considerations that uh, will impact you as you make your transition. Uh, we're going to talk about some career choices and you know occupational choices, things that are relevant. We're going to do it in context of both uh, pre-separation and post-separation or pre- and post-retirement, because sometimes, you know, people are preparing, you might be preparing to, you know, to separate or retire, but then there's also the cases where you have retired or you have separated, and you might see some opportunities here that you can make your, make some improvements to uh, things that you didn't pay attention to before or whatnot. So this is sort of for everybody, whether you've already separated or you're planning to separate or retire. All right. Um, so as we go in, we're going to start out with the pay and benefits side of things. Um, the biggest thing here, and this is sort of tapping into a lot of what I've heard over the years from both junior officers, senior officers, and enlisted folks that are making their transition or retiring. And, and it really, it's uh, avoiding taking a step backwards for every step forward you take. Uh, everybody seems to have a feeling of being amputated from their community. And that is, you know, to one degree or another, people are prepared for it. But at the same time, I've had people say to me, you know, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I, you know, these, these are folks that are 20 years, 30 years, or just four years in. And they're not really completely mentally psyched for what's on the other side in the civilian world because they've not done that before. Um, so if we can, you know, take some steps to prepare for that, uh, the mental break that happens, you know, the, the psychological break from your community and, and the, the lifestyle that you've been accustomed to, um, that'll help you out. The other side of it is that, especially for senior officers, people have been in for 20 or 30 years, uh, there's a, a sense of a lack or a loss of relevance once you get out, because while you're in, you of course you have your whole career on your chest, on your hat, you know, on your cover, and you know, on your collar. And once you're out of the service and you're in civilian clothes, you kind of blend in with everybody else. So there's a little bit of separation anxiety that happens. I think no matter what your history is or, or what your position has been. Um, what we want to do is in this webinar financially help ease some of that burden. So let's talk a little bit about uh, negotiating comparable benefits. Um, once you decide to get out of the service, you know, when you're in the service, you know what your benefits are. We have rights and responsibilities workshops. We have uh, leadership management courses. You know, you get 30 days of paid leave per year, medicals covered, all that kind of stuff. But that information isn't forthcoming. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, really in your face when you get out from the VA or whatever. And you have to negotiate your own benefits package many times when you take a job with a civilian company. Now, the, a, a lot of companies out there have a benefits package, a pretty standard benefits package. But really, um, when it comes to negotiating things like a, a bonus, an annual bonus, a pay raise, you know, a scheduled sort of pay raise, um, medical benefits, life insurance, the company car with the gas card, you know, anything like that, that is up to you 
to negotiate. And so you could take two people that are equivalent in pay at a company uh, and maybe even equivalent in their position, but they have completely separate sets of benefits based on what they've been able to negotiate. So that is one thing to, to keep in mind as you're going through the process of separating and taking on a position in a civilian company. Uh, you will also undoubtedly have some changes to your tax situation be between tax deductions, uh, things that are taken out of your pay. Because as you know, in the military, pays are taxable and allowances are not. But once you are out, uh, everything is taxable and your retirement may be tax-free based on what state you live in and they may not tax military retirements. Uh, certainly VA pensions are tax exempt. But any job that you would take, any career choice you would make, whether it's hourly or, or salaried, you're going to be, be paying additional income tax on, uh, on the money that you make. So you have to figure in that computation when you're making your decisions on what, what offers to accept or not. So factor that in, and we're, we're going to circle back to that in a little bit as well. Uh, there will be some cost of living adjustments. Now, I know I'm kind of motoring through this. On a good note, you're going to have speaker's notes available to you after the uh, session with some clarifying, amplifying, and, and uh, you know, detail there that'll cover some of this in more detail. But the, uh, the plan for, you know, you, got, you have to plan for the cost of living adjustments. Maybe your home of record was Illinois, uh, sort of middle of the country, but you might be stationed in Jacksonville and be looking at a job in Los Angeles. The cost of living is way different between Jacksonville and Los Angeles, and the Navy will pay to move you back to your home of record in most cases, so that gets you halfway across the country. You'll have some adjustments and some costs that uh, are going to creep into this, and because of that, you're going to want to make sure that you have a livable, workable budget. Now, this is sort of preaching to the choir, I know, because as supply people, we have all budgeted, but it's a little bit different in the civilian world because with a home budget, especially because in the Navy, we plan for spending everything down to zero at the end of the fiscal year, or we don't get as much the next year. That doesn't work so well for household economics because then you end up uh, overextending yourself potentially. So we, we want to make sure that as we're going through this, you, uh, you create a workable budget. And a, a lot of times people look at a budget as a restriction. They look at it as you know trying to, to limit the spending that you do. And I really don't think that's a healthy way to look at budgeting. I think budgets are to set aside money and allocate it so that you can do the things you wanna do. And you just have to be able to do things a little bit more strategically in order to make ends meet at the end of every month and start building a savings. So, um, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I'm going to show you a couple of ways in this webinar that we teach in the financial acumen course that, uh, that Bob mentioned that will help you put money aside without putting effort into it. Uh, it'll create money from thin air, essentially. And that sounds a little bit hokey, but stick with me and I'll show you kind of the strategies that are involved in doing that. Uh, with that livable budget, you have to factor in the cost of inflation. Obviously, things that are a little more expensive post pandemic and whatnot. And the Fed targets a two to two and a half percent inflation rate. But over the past couple of years, you've seen four to eight uh, percent of inflation. And that needs to be something worked into your budget so you don't end up spending money on credit cards using credit as an extension of your income. That's a very dangerous thing to do. And a lot of folks, I would say probably close to 70 or 80 percent of our clients that we work with with military history have gone into that realm of spending money on credit cards, treating credit as an extension of their income because of not negotiating really well with benefits and so forth. So hopefully, if you're taking notes on these things, all of these things dovetail together. And, uh, you know, along with the, you know, putting together a, a workable budget, considering inflation, you want to make sure that you set aside an emergency fund. A lot of folks will say, well, I, I have a month, you know, they'll plan for a month of extra income, you know, money put aside to savings. Um, I, I think that a three month um, emergency fund is much more realistic and safe because there are going to be 
unforeseen expenses, things that break, things that you just weren't planning for. Um, and so having an emergency fund will offset some of the surprise cost of living changes that you're going to go through. And I'm not telling you this to scare you because obviously if you're making the decision to step out of the military, whether it's retiring or separating, you've already been aware of some of these things, but putting it in context, we wanna make sure that you know, you're, you're planning ahead for an emergency fund and a budget and negotiating your benefits and, and so forth. You wanna make sure at least to make an apples to apples transition. And that is kind of tough to do when you haven't been there before because, and I went through this myself, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're not taking a step backwards. You want to at least get that apples to apples transition, because one of the things to consider is you're going to experience a pay gap if you're retiring, because the end of the month comes along and then the, the next month that you've retired, you don't get paid for that month until the following month, the first of the month. So there's a month of no income that you'll experience. Now, if you're you know, on terminal leave and you're, you're going ahead and starting a job and you're getting a paycheck, then that's, that's a happy situation. But you certainly don't want to be taken by surprise by having a gap in pay that you didn't plan for and then find yourself in duress. Um, one of the things that happens sometimes is that you, know, you do your best in making calculations to adjust to whatever the cost of living will be where you're going to move to and adjusting for taxes and all that stuff. But you just really don't know what it's going to be until you get there. And I, I went through that myself. Uh, so one of the things that you can do as you're talking to your new employer is ha have a kind of a heart to heart and say, look, I, I'm looking to make this a win-win for both of us. This is a good, good fit. Um, you know, I'd like to take a look at 90 days into this to make sure, you know, I prove myself to you. And then if, uh, you know, the, the math works out this way that uh, I'm, I'm getting less or earning less that, than I was before, if we could make an adjustment at that 90 day period. And I went ahead and did that myself. It turned out that the electric bill, I went from, from Chesapeake, Virginia to Greensboro, North Carolina, and, you know, my electric bill went up and I had different taxes and so on and so forth. So as it turns out, you know, by working with my first employer after I got out of the service, um, you know, there was a $700 per month adjustment that they were willing to make, but we had discussed it up front. So I would say proactively adjust, you know, feel them out and uh, address that if you're not making or not taking an offer that's as much as you think you should be getting you know, apples to apples so that you can work that out down the road a little bit. 90 days, I think, is a fair testing period where you've shown that you are what they are, were looking for, what they expected to hire, and you know they're gonna compensate you appropriately for that. So moving on to some other benefits that you have while you're still in the service, you have legal services that are open to you. And I would recommend really strongly that you take advantage of these legal services. Things like power, power of attorney, living wills and, and last will and testament. When you are done with the service, you retire, you, you separate, um, you know, a, a will and testament, last will and testament can cost easily just for a basic one, three to $500. Whereas those kinds of services are available to you, powers of attorney and so are, are, are available to you at no additional cost. You know, you get those services for free as part of being a service member. So I would really recommend a couple of months prior to separating or retiring that you take a trip to the legal services office and you know work out some of the paperwork, get that uh, you know signed, sealed, and recorded, and and so forth, so that you can minimize those expenses that are eventually they they are uh, expenses everybody deals with. But if you can take care of it at no cost before you get out, that makes more sense. Uh, the the next and this is really big. The next real big thing here is to make sure that your, uh, your life insurance is handled. You're going to lose SGLI. You'll have the opportunity for a short time to convert that without having to have a physical or anything. But uh, so you can convert that to VGLI, which is Veterans Group Life Insurance. But maybe you want to look at other options as well. And like I mentioned in the previous slide with the benefits, you'll be able to perhaps work that into your employment benefits, your employer-sponsored life insurance. There's a lot of companies there that offer those kinds of benefits. Um, if that is not something that you can, you know, or you want to pursue, 
take a look at some of the military centric organizations that are out there. There's Navy Mutual Aid Association, there's USAA, uh, and the, more re recently, the VA has come out with their own life insurance, term insurance policies with VA Life. So you might wanna take a look at those or on the civilian side of things as well with group insurance rates, there's AARP, AAA, Ethos and so forth that are available to you. So one way or the other, you wanna make sure that your family's covered and you, you need to be deciding whether you want term life insurance or whole life insurance or universal life insurance. There's differences between those. Um, you know, term life insurance is least expensive and some of the others like whole life and universal life can have cash options available where they actually are used as investments. So talk to a life insurance person, a life insurance salesperson agent, uh, but be very careful with that. I would advise you to be careful with that because they make their commission on the policy they sell in most cases. So you want to shop around, you want to make sure that you're informed and you have those, uh, you know, you have an understanding of what each of those types of policies involve and, you know, get the best rate you can. There's all kinds of different rates and it really will amaze you. Um, you can get the same coverage sometimes for $12 in a term policy and the same exact coverage on another term policy could be $70 per month. So you really shop around. When you are shopping around, I would recommend that you, be careful because you're going to get spammed if you use the internet. What will end up happening is if you do a quote search on the internet, you're going to end up with probably 30 seconds after you submit that, your phone starts ringing and you'll start receiving emails. Uh, so if you're going to do an internet search for life insurance options, I recommend putting together a, a just a throwaway email account, an AOL account, a Gmail account, a Yahoo account, something where when the spam starts flowing in, uh, you can turn your back on it once you get the information that you need from whatever policy you decide to get, because the spam won't stop, but you don't want that going into your personal email. So that, um, I think that covers our life insurance side of things. Uh, let's look at a couple of more things with the VA. Now the VA, like I mentioned, the uh, while you're in the service, you pretty much know what your, your benefits are, your rights and so forth, and, and the things you're entitled to. But once you get out, it's, it's sort of find and you know, seek and find for the VA benefits. And that's where there's a few resources that you should consider and do a little bit of brushing up on before you actually walk away from the Navy. And the first one is the VA government, you know, VA.gov site, the benefits section there. It's probably the driest, most boring reading that you will experience, but it is the most valuable experience, you know, information that you can experience as you are making your transition decisions. There's so many benefits you're entitled to. None of it's exciting to read about, but it's very interesting and applicable depending on your unique set of circumstances. So what, what I would recommend doing uh, in that process, go down the left margin of all the benefits and just cherry pick what seems right to you. And one of the things that you really, really ought to do, and, and I, I'm going to emphasize this, get tested for whatever ails you before you are out of the service. Now, when I, when I say that, what I'm talking about is um, if you are getting tested for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a 50% disability. That sounds crazy, but if you have sleep apnea, then you're more likely to have hypertension, stroke, those kinds of things down the road if it's not treated. But if it's diagnosed, that's a 50% disability, up to 100%. And we're gonna talk about 100% in just a moment uh, and what those benefits are. And we're not, I'm not suggesting or, or you know, I'm not even, I'm not suggesting that you game the system or you make anything up, but if you have chronic issues, headaches, anything with, uh, you know, like migraines, like I said, any chronic issues, you want those things documented so that as time goes on, your VA, you know, compensation will go up when you need that, in, that income. I mean, you're, you're being compensated for anything that happened while you were in the service. The service didn't make you have sleep apnea. 
But if it happened while you were in, it is service connected and service connected stuff has to be documented. Well, it doesn't have to be, but it is more, it's easier to get things through on your claim if it's documented while you're still in. In my case, I went through a little bout of cancer. So if you had skin cancer or any other kind of cancer, that's a disability. Even if you're completely in remission or it's no longer a factor, you want to document it. So try not to you know, discount that. And you, know, you want that done before you leave. You want a copy of your medical record before you leave as well. When I looked last, um, it was about two years ago, the VA in Philadelphia was farming out batches of claims to other VA regional offices around the country because they were overwhelmed with claims from Afghanistan and, and people coming back from Iraq and so on and so forth. So you, know, you, you wanna have a copy of your medical record as it's being sent around the country with your package and whatnot. You definitely don't want that to get lost in the mail or shuffled under another pile of papers on someone's desk. Have a copy for your own records. All right, um, as we continue down the path, looking into the VA loan, if you're going to buy a house, the VA loan is something that is, uh, it, it's more competitive, better rates than other loans that are out there, FHA loans and so on and so forth. You're, you're entitled to it. It's a zero payment down, you know, zero down payment to it, uh, better rates. And the other thing is back to the 100% VA rating. If you are rated at 100%, then the 2.5% admin fee that is associated with getting a VA loan is waived. So there are additional benefits besides just compensation that you get for being credited at a 100% rate. Uh, again, I'm not suggesting gaming anything. I'm saying legit, add anything that ails you into your claim and make sure that you get it checked out with the VA. You want to talk to your local VA rep. Everybody's town has a local VA rep, somebody that represents your area and your county. And that local VA rep can help you explore your benefits further, but they also are familiar with your state benefits. And yes, the, the VA has state benefits. Um, and, and those range from state to state. So in some cases, your property tax on your personal, your primary residence is waived. In other cases, the uh, the whole situation where you know you can it can be something as simple as a, a hunting and fishing license that you get as being a veteran. Um, a lot of places in some in states are they allow you to uh, apply for and get uh, filed with the state paperwork for your LLC or for an S corporation, and they waive the fee as a veteran. So th these are all benefits that are available to you that you won't know about unless you actually actually ask about them. Those are things uh, to consider. And then consider having the, the uh, disabled American veterans handle your VA claim. The, the DAV does a lot of work. They are disabled veterans themselves and they will help push your claim through. They know the wickets and the, the hurdles that go into um, filing a claim and getting it pushed through faster with the VA and making sure things are done right so that they are approved on the first go around and you don't end up back and forth um, with a uh, you know, appeals process. So that, uh, those are things to consider. And then we have other benefits as well for your family. If you are on the 100% rating uh, where your, your disability is 100% service connected, you can get chapter 35 benefits for your family. That chapter 35 benefits are educational benefits for your, your kids, your spouse. Um, and what that does, it puts an extra thousand plus dollars in their pockets if they're full time enrolled students at a university that's a you know accredited university. So they can use that money for books, tuition, room and board, or ice cream. The VA doesn't care. They are awarding that chapter 35 benefit package to your family based on your eligibility as being 100% rated. Uh, that considered that in addition to that, I mentioned also, um, you know, insurance before, you know, family life insurance, health insurance. Well, health insurance, if you are eligible by being 100% rated, health insurance, the CHAMP VA program provides for your family. They will cover your health care, your family's health care. 
your health care is covered by the VA if you're 100% rated. So anything related to your medical uh, situation will be taken care of by the VA, including dental if you are uh, I, eyesight and dental if you are um, at the 100% rate. Uh, the last thing, and I mentioned it a moment ago, was the um, your property tax. You know, your property tax exemptions, these are, these are the states that you can be property tax exempt. And this is thousands of dollars for whatever house that you, you own as your primary residence uh, in these states. If you have property taxes assessed at four or five thousand dollars, six thousand dollars, and you're hundred percent rated in one of these states and you you qualify for the property tax exemption based on the state's requirements, uh, then that's money that you don't have to pay. That's a, a nice benefit to have, and it's on a statewide basis. That's not a federal program, it's a state program. So things to keep in mind as you go down the path. Um, so with all of that said. Uh, let's talk about some career choices after you retire. So what, what are you going to do when, when you're done? Are you going to go and get an hourly job? Or are you going to get a salary job? Uh, some people just shift colors and go from wearing khakis to civilian clothes, and they start as a contractor doing what they were already doing. Or are you going to start a business? And, and that's a viable option. So I'll talk a little bit about that. That's not the majority of people, but I do want to address it because it can be something that benefits you even if you take a job somewhere and that's the entrepreneurial aspects of owning a business there's uh one thing that needs to be made clear is that there is a difference a huge difference between intention to succeed and commitment to succeed uh if you find yourself thinking well you know i'll, I'll try something for a couple of years and if it doesn't work then you've already got pre-excuses i would say that's probably not the way to go um but if you are firm on, I want to own a business, I want to be my own boss, I want to be uh, in charge of, I want to be the CEO of my own ship, you know, and I, I realize that that's a, kind of a, a, a big thing. But, you know, whether it's brick and mortar, an internet based business, whether it's a, a direct sales business, a home based business, whatever the case may be, being your own boss is a huge, huge perk because you can write your own schedule. And, you know, there's, there's huge tax advantages to owning your own business. So putting it in perspective, if we're looking at you owning your own business and your next door neighbor has a nine to five job, uh, in all likelihood, you both have cell phones, you both have computers, you probably both have a study or an office in your home. Um, there's, there's things, you both drive cars. So there are things that you have in common with your neighbor that's not a business owner. But as a business owner, those expenses are deductions if they are incidental to operating your business. And what that translates to is your cell phone can be a deduction, your computer, your toner for your printer, all of the little things that you have in your house. If you have a business that you are running with those things, then those become tax deductions. And the way that businesses are taxed versus the way employees are taxed Employees have tax taken right off the top of their pay. They never see it. It shows up on their W-2 at the end of the year as, as deductions. Businesses, on the other hand, have income from their, their services or products, sales, and that income is offset by deductions, and the taxation is on what's left over. So you're taxed on your net, not on your gross. As an employee, you're taxed on your gross income. So again, it's not what you make that matters, it's what you get to keep. And if you can keep more of your income, then apples to apples, you can actually enjoy a better lifestyle with more perks than somebody who doesn't have that ability. So find the right help. I've done a lot of business coaching myself, but there's a lot of help out there to get you know, set up with a business, done, done the right way. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, coaching that's available to help you cut corners where you would otherwise make mistakes. And there's a lot of times there's an easier, better, faster way to do it that's more efficient without having to go through a learning curve yourself. So I would recommend finding a mentor, a business coach, or somebody for guidance. And for sure, make use of the resources that are available to you. And that would be like the Small Business Association. There's a, no there's a number of things locally as well as federally that are open to you. And if you have questions on that, I don't want to belabor the point on it, but if you have questions on it, please 
feel free to ask after the session and we'll, we'll cover some of that stuff. You can monetize a hobby into a business. And so if you like something, if you're a crafty person, you like to do crafts, if you have a, you, you like to create, you know, fishing lures, uh, you like to work on computers and repair them, whatever the case may be. I have a, a client that has a dog kennel um, in their backyard. So they have a business, a home-based business. It's a dog kennel. I have other clients that are website uh, hosting people. They have websites, they do web design and I taught them how to do that stuff. And I've worked with them and they are doing this from home as a sideline to their nine to five job. So that being considered, here are a few ideas that might be applicable to you just to get your brain working on things that are available out there. An eBay store, an Amazon store, you could do Etsy, an Etsy store, consulting, direct sales. If you're real estate, you know, get your real estate license or whatnot. Um, the focus on owning a business, I would, this is more of a recommendation to you than anything else. If you're going to own a business, I recommend pursuing it in a residual payment fashion. So let's look at the real estate agent for a minute. Um, there's two ways you can be a real, a real estate investor, for example. You can buy and flip houses, and then you're making money when you buy and sell a house. If you don't sell a house, you don't make any money. So there's no retirement in that. Whereas a, another person could buy a house and then lease it out to people and be a landlord, uh, have somebody manage that property. And that money is residual. It keeps coming in month after month. And it's something that allows them to build into a more thriving, successful business. And if you do that, your plan B business to your plan A job, when your plan B starts making more money than your plan A, it makes you kind of in, be in that spot where you have to decide, do you wanna keep working a job or do you wanna shift focus and build your business further? Those are things to consider. Now, if you've already been in business for a while, let's say that you separated years ago and you have had employees, W2 employees that you've been paying and you went through the pandemic years 2020 and 2021, uh, there's, a perk that is available to you if you're eligible based on a number of different factors. And I want you to be able to go to this website, uh, prosper-erc.com. It's a web page on the Your Debt Free Future site to look into this further. Because if you had employees in a business that was in 2020 and 2021 during the pandemic, you could be eligible for a grant of up to $26,000 per employee. That is cash in your pocket that is paid to you. It is not a, a loan that you have to pay back or get forgiven. It is a legit program and there's information on the website that's listed there. So I would say definitely look into that. If you've had a business during that time and you had employees, uh, don't miss this opportunity. It's, it is actually literally free money from the government to reward you for keeping employees on board during those times. So keep that in mind. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about being money smart and strategically leveraging your income. And this is, these are the kinds of things that are taught in the financial acumen course that, that was mentioned earlier and that I'll, I'll probably mention again. Um, but this is how you can actually do more with less and not have to pay anything to put more, put more money in your pocket. Let's take a look at this. If you're behind the power curve, and let's say that you already did separate and you didn't make some of these provisional plans and do the budget thing and all that stuff, um, or you're getting ready to separate, or you just wanna get ahead, consider opening up a high yield savings account. Now I'm using VO Bank as an example here. They're not paying me to tell you this or anything else, um, but Discover Bank, American Express, there's a lot of banks that are out there that actually have high yield savings account. But right now, VO Bank, as of a couple of days ago, is paying 5.02% uh, uh, annual percentage yield on their money market savings. Most people deposit their paycheck into a checking account that pays zero or next to zero percent. But what if, and here's the what if, what if you were to have a savings account like this with VO Bank that you deposited your paycheck into and allowed your paycheck to accrue compounding interest over the next 15 days until your next paycheck. Well, here's the thing. You can take money out of a money market account six times per month. So if you pay your bills twice a month when you get paid, you can 
take money out, transfer it automatically to your checking account, pay your bills with that the same time that your next paycheck is deposited into your high yield savings account. And what that does is if you do that, you know, wash, rinse and repeat, you do that month after month after month, automating the transfers, because you can do auto bill pay and stuff, especially like with Navy Federal and whatnot, then that process allows you to earn 5.02% on your paycheck ongoing. It's a really easy way just by changing the flow of your cash, changing your cash flow, the direction of it from going into a checking account to going into a high yield savings account to earn additional money with zero effort. It's free money out of thin air for compounding interest on your paycheck. Kind of a neat idea, but we can do more with it. So let's talk about that a little bit as a financial consideration to getting ready to separate or retire, or even after you've separated or retired. Uh, let's talk about how you can strategically leverage paying off your house faster. And this is kind of a, this was an eye opener to me a few years back when I kind of learned about this. And I'm, if I can save you that time and you can learn it now, instead of a few years down the road, that'll be good. You can cancel interest off of your amortized debts. And, and you know that you can make an additional payment uh, towards principal. And everybody kind of knows that, you know, oh, I can pay extra principal and it'll reduce my debt. Here's how that actually works though. And this is kind of a visual it's really impressive. Let's say we have a loan and this is, uh, we're gonna use an amortized loan of $250,000. So it'll be a mortgage loan that we're using, but you can do this with student loans. You can do this with car loans, uh, any amortized loan. And basically with this loan, $250,000 at a 5.5% interest rate, we would be making 12 payments per year uh, of $1,420 thereabouts, okay? Everybody sees that. So what the amortization schedule looks like for that is you have your principal and interest. This is the first year of payments. And so if we make our $1,419.47 payment, then that's a combination of principal and interest. And the interest, even though it's a 5.5% loan, that interest is $1,145 out of that $1,400 that's 87 or 80.7 percent. So it's not 5 percent that you're actually paying. And so it's kind of a rude awakening because amortized loans use front loaded interest. And when we take that little tidbit of information and we say, OK, what if we take our payment of 273 of principal and 1145, our total payment of 11 uh, of fourteen hundred and twenty dollars? What if we throw on next month's principal amount onto that payment as extra principal to the loan? Well, what ends up happening if we do that, off the back end of the loan, we end up canceling $1,144, which means your house is going to get paid off a little bit sooner. If we happen to have an extra $3,000 in the bank that we could accrue by using some of the strategies that we teach, uh, then if you paid $3,094, which is all of this extra principal, towards your loan, then you cancel an entire chunk of $12,500 off the back end of your loan and one year. It's easier to do that when the loan is new because more of your payment is, is interest during that time. So it's much more affordable to, to make a smaller principal payment. But let's put this in practical terms. Not everybody has $3,000 laying around for a loan like this. So just keep in mind with this 5%, 5.5% loan, when it's all said and done, if you follow the amortization schedule all the way through to the end of the loan, you will have paid more than twice the amount of money that you borrowed. You will have double paid for your house. And that's, that's not what most people want to do. So how can we do this a little bit easier, faster, and more practically? Well, one of the things we can do here, and I'm going to compare what the bank will try to sell you sometimes with a biweekly mortgage. Banks like biweekly mortgages because it, it sounds good. Uh, it does help you a little bit, but let's talk about the individual pieces of a biweekly mortgage. Um, so there's 26 payments a year. You have 52 weeks in a year, 26 payments. That uh, translates to 
to one full extra mortgage payment per year. So you have actually 13 full mortgage payments in a year with a biweekly mortgage. So you have to make payments every two weeks, which constrains you a little bit contractually with the bank. And the extra payments, principal and interest, you are going to make some headway on your house. You're gonna pay down the loan a little bit faster. So it reduces your balance faster. Your house gets paid off a little bit earlier. But what if, here's the what if, what if instead of binding yourself to every two weeks making a payment, what if you decided to do a strategic monthly payment? And that is make a, a monthly payment, regular 12 months per year, plus one twelfth of your, your monthly payment towards principal. So you're, you're making a small payment. In this case, this loan would be about $120 a month. You're making a one full extra mortgage payment per year. And in doing so, you have to you, you realize that you're not confined to a, a bank's every two weeks thing. So if you have a hardship, you lose your job, you get sick, something happens to a family member, you need to deal with an unexpected expense, you're not bound to a two-week thing. You know, the the end result of this is that you end up being able to have a full 100 percent principal payment, extra payment per year, instead of principal and interest. Remember, the interest is only a couple hundred dollars, or the, the principal is only a couple hundred dollars in uh, the early part of your loan. So you're paying off more principal, which can, cancels more interest, and you're getting your loan paid off even faster. So you can do that by combining this technique with putting your paycheck into a savings account and then earning interest on it to offset that. So it's not principal that's coming completely out of your pocket. It's principal that generates because you got strategic and then you're going to work for money. Your money's going to work for you. If you employ these, these techniques, you can get way further ahead, way faster and have something to show for it and save money off the top. Now, if you want to pursue this concept, you know, pursue this for yourself, I'm going to share with you, you know, an opportunity here that I will do a free financial analysis for you. We have um, a form here that, you know, you can fill out. You, you don't put any personal information in there like social security numbers or account numbers or passwords or anything like that. Um, when you fill out the form, what ends up, what we'll do is run it through an algorithm-based software package to see mathematically, which is not magic, it's just math, what you can expect, you'll get a report from that, what you can expect to save, how much time you can expect to save off of your mortgage to get debt free and be able to bank that money instead of paying it to your lenders. So in a case like this, you know, you'll be able, this is actually real client data without their real information on top, but this client just, they didn't make a whole lot of money and they didn't, they, they live modestly. And so this isn't like you have to be rich to do this, but bottom line is, you know, saving $226,000 of interest over the course of the loan, uh, saving 17.4 years off of the loan. In other words, they had a brand new shiny 30 year mortgage and they were able to pay it off 17.4 years earlier just by employing some neat little strategies like we're talking about. And then, and this is laughable, at a measly 1% interest return on investment, which you can of course do better than that. You can do uh, very easily four, five, six, 10% with different investments that you might have. But at 1%, if they took the money that they were paying to their lenders and followed their lender's schedule and instead put that in a 1% return on investment, they'd have a million three hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars at the end of the time where they would be debt free otherwise with zero in the bank. That is what strategies can do for you. And I'm happy to help you with that. Those are things to consider as you transition. It's certainly even after you transition. Those kinds of numbers make a life-changing uh, impact on your lifestyle, your, your future, the things that you can do, be able to fill your bucket list and, and take care of everything that's on it and so on. So as we wind this down, um, as we wrap this up, avoid pay, you know, basically avoid taking on more debt as you are getting ready to transition out. Try to pay off your debts, try to become debt-free. Uh, before you leave the service. That is the optimal, but it's not always realistic depending on where you are financially. 
Uh, so we have options to look at that to say, hey, here's where you are mathematically, here's where you could be, and we can base that on solely your situation as well as your lifestyle. Uh, I would caution you to please be careful about consolidation loans. They may look good on the surface, but usually they have a, an origination fee and there's little fees in the fine print that you may not be aware of that can be little gotchas and you can actually spend more money using a, you know, spend out more money trying to consolidate debt than if you were to use a strategic approach to paying it off, um, you know, as we talked about. Be careful with deferred interest. I'll say I had a client that uh, ended up with um, a, a deferred interest credit account. They had a $12,000 loan to start with and it ended up, they got $200 shy when the deadline ended and it added $4,000 of interest back to the account. And that's when they came to us and said, hey, uh, help me with this. I need some, some help. Uh, we wanna avoid those situations. So please read the fine print, be very careful about using a credit account or a promotional account that has deferred interest. And also anything that has interest only, and this is really student loans fall into this category most likely. Uh, interest only loans, you gotta realize interest is just giving away money to the bank. You have nothing to show for it and your balances stay the same. Um, you know, so in, in the big picture of things, when we're, we're looking at an interest only payment, it is one of the worst scenarios you can be in. It's the banks love you for it, but it's not in your best interest and protect your credit score. Now, if you have a security clearance, your credit score is important. If you want to avoid higher rates and fees, uh, whether you're renting a place or you're applying for credit, your credit score is important. Uh, be careful about that, protect it, it does matter. And we can go into that in more detail individually. And once and for all, don't treat your credit as an extension of your income. If anything I covered here resonates with you, that is, you know, the financial acumen course is, is something that you might want to look at. Uh, when it comes to the financial acumen course, you can find it on yourdebtfreefuture.com. And one of the things is sort of a public service announcement that I'm going to say here is, is that we're going to save you 20% off of the tuition. The tuition is, is $150 for the course, typically. Uh, it is over 15 hours of little gems and nuggets and strategies and stuff tailored to your specific financial situation. Um, and we're going to knock $30 off of that if you use the code here, the coupon code NSCF-20. And in addition to that, what I will be doing is matching that $30 with a donation to the foundation. So it's helping you, it's helping the foundation, and everybody's, it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, that is something that uh, I, I think if you dig into it, you'll find that if you like the, the few slides there we talked about with saving interest and strategies and so on and so forth, um, there's a whole course for that that is put together to help you master your money and become really money smart. It's on Fox, it's on Roku, it's on ABC, NBC, CBS, and um, it's been featured also on, um, on uh, USA Today. So that being said, I, I kind of motored through it. I know that was a lot of material. Here is my contact information so that if you have questions, you can reach out to me. Please do. Uh, I am happy to go over individual circumstances, obviously, that you wouldn't want to discuss in a in a uh, web environment with everybody, but uh, there's my phone number, there's my email address. Again, take advantage of that savings and help the foundation as well. And Dan, Bob, that's that's all I have. I appreciate it, and I'll take questions if you want. All right, a lot, lot of a uh, lot of good information. I think How many that was... a question come through. Ooh, okay, the question is: Is there any particular life insurance company? That you recommend for term life? Well, I, I, I've I've liked uh, Navy Mutual Aid. That uh, they've been very fair. They also I I had a um, whole life policy and converted it because I was investing the money that that I was saving on not paying premiums. But um, you know that they've been a very good company for that in my experience. So Navy Mutual Aid Association, uh, I can 
send whoever asked the question, I can send them the information on it. They can look them up online. It's, uh, I, I found them to be good. It's not the only game in town, of course, but, but I have found them to be reliable and level term. So without having to go and, and worry about brackets that are stepping up over time. Now, when I hit 72 years old, I don't want to have the need for that anymore. Um, no, I still have other policies in place that are level term beyond that. All right, a lot of a lot okay. of good, good information to uh, to unpack, and and I know that people will uh, eventually uh, uh, start to have uh, other questions, and they have your contact information if they have anything uh, specific uh, that they need to um, uh, ask about. Because, uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of information there, uh, and a lot of a lot of good information. I appreciate uh, I just, the opportunity to share it too. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm glad I'm glad we were able to get you on. This is a uh, key topic that everybody needs to know uh, a lot about and be smart about when they're uh, transitioning out. Yeah, Tom, thank you very much for um, for your presentation. Uh, we'll make sure we get your your slides be posted, your speaker notes, which I think has a lot of good detail in there. For everybody to read, and then uh, a few of the questions that came in, we'll uh, we'll answer. So for the participants, attendees, thank you for attending, and, and uh, stay tuned for that. We'll send a link out. But Tom, thank you very much uh, for uh, for yeah. your your uh, your presentation. Really good stuff. And this is not just for transitioning. Everybody, I benefited and I saw a few things I want to look into too. So uh, we appreciate that, Tom. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so this concludes our webinar uh, for tonight. So thank you all for attending. Um, again. Um, we're going to have webinars every month. Our next one is in late July. Uh, we'll be sending the registration out probably next week. Um, we've got a, a, a really good slate of uh, additional transition webinars. Um, and uh, uh, so I think you'll look forward, you'll, you'll appreciate seeing those when they come out. Um, again, uh, you know, if you haven't done so, consider making a donation to the foundation. We appreciate that. We do need your support. Um, you can use the QR codes. And again, um, that's it. Uh, recording will be posted. We'll get that link out to everybody soon. Um, again, thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your evening.